Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. I want to welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Thank you so very much for tuning in and being a part of this online uh, time of learning and growing together. Tonight begins the first of a series of nine lessons on the fruit of the Spirit. I'm really excited about uh, what we're going to get to study about together over these next nine weeks. So uh, as people are logging on, uh, we would love for you to let us know you are here. Please just put in the comments, um, hey, I'm here. Feel free to comment if you hear something you like. Feel free to be a part of the conversation tonight as we learn and grow together. But before we get into our lesson, I want to highlight uh, just a few prayer requests this evening. Uh, as we are praying tonight, we want to continue to remember Pastor Rudd. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Gerald Rudd, who uh, contracted COVID and has been uh, in ICU for a few weeks now. Uh, he is showing slight improvement. We're grateful for that. But we want to continue to pray for him. We also want to remember uh, Pastor Miller and his family here in this area. Um, struggling. Uh, he and, and his family each got COVID, and uh, this gentleman has had the hardest time with it. He also uh, is in ICU and just having a very, very difficult time um, with his health and with COVID. We want to remember Pastor Mills and his family. Uh, let's continue to pray for Charlie Coates. Uh, Charlie's been battling back problems for some time, and we just want to pray that everything will go well with him. We also want to remember Judy Wingler. This week she is having knee surgery and very much needs the Lord's touch. Maybe there are some needs that you have that you would like to, for us to be aware of. Please feel free to put those in the comments or send them to us in a direct message. Let's take some time and pray together this evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather up tonight and to study your word together. Lord, I thank you that we get this opportunity to learn and to grow. And I just pray, Lord, for your blessing and your anointing on this time. Lord, tonight we are mindful of several prayer requests. And uh, we just ask that you would be with each of these. We pray, Lord, for Gerald Rudd and ask, Lord, that you would uh, have mercy on him and that you would bring healing to him. Lord, I thank you for the slight improvement that he has incurred and I pray, Father, you'd continue to bring about the healing in his body. Lord, we pray for uh, Pastor Marvin. We understand, Lord, he is struggling for his life as well. And we just ask that you would have mercy and that you'd make him whole, well, and complete. We pray for Charlie this evening. Lord, please relieve him of the pain that he's in. Uh, Lord, be with him and with Lisa and the boys and keep them close to you. Lord, we ask that you would be with Judy as she faces this procedure on her knee. We pray, Lord, that everything would go well with this and that you would uh, give her a full and a speedy recovery. Father, for the other requests that are represented in our church body, those that are being messaged in, we lift them before you. We entrust them to your care. And we just pray your perfect will and way would be done in each and every one. Lord, again, we ask that you would bless as we begin the study tonight on the fruit of the Spirit. We pray, Lord, for your anointing and your blessing on the sharing of your word and the hearing of your word. More than anything, Lord, help us to take in what you're saying to us and to live it out in a way that gives you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray and say together, amen and amen. Thank you for taking time to agree in prayer together with me. Tonight we're going to begin a study on the fruit of the Spirit. And our text for this evening is Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 23, and also 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, recently, I shared a message on Sunday morning about uh, the day of Pentecost and what that means and how uh, Jesus had promised the disciples that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them to be witnesses for him. Now, uh, that happened on the day of Pentecost and that power that was received through the infilling of the Holy Spirit did indeed enable them to do great things and to be powerful witnesses to the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what it did as well is it began producing in their lives what Paul later referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. And we're going to focus uh, for the next nine weeks, starting tonight and going for nine weeks, on what those fruit are and how we need to um, let God develop these in our lives. So let's look first 
at what Paul had to say in Galatians, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 16 and going through verse 23. Galatians 5, beginning at verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. As Paul writes to the church at Galatia, he is um, informing them in this part of the, of the scripture and of his letter that it is possible to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and to have the fruit of the Spirit produced in your life. That, quite honestly, is the evidence that the Spirit is in your life. It's not some particular spiritual gift. It is the fruit of the Spirit being borne out in your life day in and day out. Now, as Paul addresses the believers at Galatia, he, he's encouraging them and us to walk in the Spirit. And as we do that, we're not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, Paul's very honest and clear in these verses that it is possible to walk in the flesh. And when you do that, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Um, there's a little poem that um, somebody shared. I don't know who specifically originated it, so I can't give them credit, but I do want to share it with us tonight. It basically goes like this. Two natures beat within my breast. The one is foul, the other blessed. The one I love, the other I hate. The one I feed will dominate. I don't know who came up with that, but it's pretty accurate. Within us, there is this humanity uh, and, and that, that reaches out to do the things of the flesh. Um, and if we follow that, and we sow to the flesh, we're going to re reap the things of the flesh. But Paul is telling us that it is possible to have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, and we're to walk in that Spirit, and as we do that, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, walking in the flesh, according to Paul, produces a whole lot of things that we don't want to have anything to do with. Among the things he listed were this, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of, uh, of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. If we sow to the flesh, we're going to see those kind of things coming out in our lives. But if we walk in the Spirit and sow to the Spirit, here are the things Paul says will happen or that will grow in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, that's a big list of nine. We're going to start with the first one tonight. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I um, think it's interesting that the first thing that Paul mentions here is that if we are truly walking in the Spirit and the Spirit of God is dwelling in us and we've been uh, in filled with the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, if you will, sanctified by the Spirit, then God is going to produce love in us. Um, that is very important to note. Now, again, it's tempting to think that if you're Spirit-filled, it's the gifts of the Spirit that are going to prove that. But Paul had to address that with the church at Corinth. And as he was dealing with various things, including the use of spiritual gifts and, quite honestly, the abuse of spiritual gifts in the Corinthian situation. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, 
he's explaining to them that not every believer gets every gift and a whole lot of other things about spiritual gifts that are worthy of reading at some point if you would like to do that. But when he gets to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he gets to verse 31 and he makes this declaration. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So Paul makes a transition from talking about gifts at this point to talking about something else that's more significant, a more excellent way, if you will. These words precede what we know to be the next chapter of 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians 13. And we commonly refer to this chapter in the Bible as the love chapter. Paul is highlighting that the fruit of the spirit of love is greater than any spiritual gift. Let me read for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Do I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. It doesn't envy, it does not parade itself, and it's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely and does not seek its own and it's not provoked and it doesn't think evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Paul, after addressing the abuse of spiritual gifts in the Corinthian church and trying to instruct them on how to adequately and faithfully use the spiritual gifts, he, he makes this great um, inspired writing of how love is preeminent over all things. And as he, uh, he explains so eloquently in these short 13 verses, um, the, the best description of love that we could ever have. And tonight, as we, we look at what this love really is, we want to break this down a little bit. And um, let's talk for a moment about what love is. Now, in the New Testament, when uh, love is used, uh, there are three different Greek words that can be used for love. And uh, one of those words is eros. That is the physical, sensual love that is to be shared between a husband and a wife. Another Greek word is phileo. That is uh, friendship or kinship or brotherly love. Hence, we have uh, the city of Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. Okay. And then we have the Greek word agape. Agape is the unconditional love that God has for the world. When uh, love is spoken of in the New Testament, the most common word that is used is agape. And when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13 about love, he's talking about agape, not eros or phileo or any other word for love. It is the unconditional love that God has for us and that he wants to cultivate in us for other people. So as we consider what love is, uh, I want to suggest a few things this evening. We need to understand love is more than an emotion. It is a commitment. 
Now, there are emotions and feelings involved with love, and thank God for that. Um, we all at some point in our lives, and maybe many of us even at this very moment, we've been in love, and we know the feelings that can come with that. Uh, and as good as those are, we need to understand it is more, love is more than an emotion. It is a commitment. Our feelings can mislead us. But true agape love, while it may have some feeling involved with it, it will have some feeling involved with it, it goes deeper than our feelings. It continues on even when those feelings may be high or low, particularly when they're low, that agape love kicks in and still acts. Now, understand this. While it's not wrong to have the good feelings that are associated with love, even with agape love, we need to understand uh, this love needs to go deeper than that. To illustrate how uh, our feelings can sometimes mislead us, uh, I want you to consider this. When they train uh, pilots, helicopter pilots in particular, and well, airline pilots as well, in the military, flying jets or helicopters or whatever, if they were to crash in the water, they, they put them through simulations with this, and when they get underwater, they are trained to get out of their harness, out of their seat, and then to begin looking for which direction the bubbles are going. The bubbles that they breathe out just very quickly and the other bubbles around are always going to go towards the surface. And if you are underwater, you want to, you got a little bit of time and you got to make your way to the surface to get some air. If you follow the bubbles, they will lead you to the surface. They're taught not to follow their feelings because in a crash, they get so disoriented. Many times they've had situations where pilots have felt like the way to the surface was actually uh, down instead of up because they were so disoriented. Their feelings had that were all out of whack, but the bubbles were always on point. So instead of going the direction they felt like going, they were trained, they trained them to go in the direction of the bubbles. We've got to keep that in mind that we need to follow the bubbles, if you will, and not our feelings when it comes to love. And that is just having that heart set commitment that you're going to love even when you don't feel like it. Okay. Now, another thing about love that we need to note, love is more than fun times. It is also responsibility. Uh, there are fun times involved with love. Uh, and thank God for that. Uh, many of you may be aware uh, I am now a pawpaw. My first grandchild is in this world, and I am thrilled. I love that little baby, and I haven't had a whole lot of time with her, but what time I have had with her, it, it, it has been very, very fun, all right? So there are fun times involved with, uh, with love, but there's also responsibility. Now, I don't bear the, by any means the full brunt of the responsibility for my grandchild, uh, my son and his wife have that responsibility of getting to love that child and to raise that child. Um, but there's responsibility that comes with that. There are good times, there are fun times, definitely. But there are, but there's responsibility that comes as well. You got to feed the child, you got to bathe the child, you got to change the child's diapers. And Pawpaws get the fun part, okay? That's really cool. But you get the idea. And here's the problem. In America, one of our favorite sports is responsibility shuffling. All right? We want to blame anybody and everybody else. We want to put the responsibility on them and not take personal responsibility. Uh, we love to blame the government for whatever is going on. Um, we want to blame the health care crisis on the government or on... Uh, you know, the big insurance industries. Could it have anything to do with our poor eating habits and the fact that, as a whole, Americans don't exercise very much? No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's all the doctor's fault or the government's fault or whoever's fault, right? Well, we know better. 
How about uh, standardized testing? If test scores go down, we want to blame the educators, and we may want to overlook the fact that uh, the, the home life of the kids is really not the greatest in some situations. Um, that honestly contributes way more to it than we ever want to admit. But here's just the simple point. We want to shift the responsibility on somebody else. We want all the credit, but none of the responsibility. And that doesn't work. That's not what love does. Love does include fun times, but it also includes responsibility. And you've got to take personal responsibility if you're going to love. Here's another thing. Uh, love is more than comfort. It is also risk. Now, when we are in loving relationships, there is a great comfort that comes with that. But there's some risk involved. Um, when you love, you open yourself up to the potential of being hurt. And most of us have been hurt deeply by the people that we love. As a matter of fact, we've been hurt more deeply by the people we love than by people we're not in close relationship with. And why does that happen? Well, we've let them in. Well, when you've let them in that close, there's the greater risk of, um, or there's the potential for that hurt to take place as well. Um, and if you've been hurt in love, there's this very real temptation to close yourself off. My friends, that is not healthy. We cannot make it through life without loving and loving well. And if you close yourself off, you're only going to hurt yourself worse. There is a risk in loving. There's great comfort in loving, but there's also risk. So take note of that. Another thing, love is more than a declaration. It is a decision. Um, C.S. Lewis said about love that one should not spend a lot of time determining if we love someone, but to simply start acting as if we did. Soon we will find that we do love them, and we will act ourselves into feeling before we will feel ourselves into acting. Take note of that. Um, let me put it in another context. I got up this morning and went to the gym. I did not feel like going to the gym. I felt like staying in bed. I really wanted to stay in bed longer. Uh, I didn't feel like it. I didn't want to, but I did it anyway. I took action to go to the gym. Even when I got there, the first few things that I did didn't feel really good. And to be honest with you, I didn't do a whole lot. I cut the routines a little shorter because of somewhere I needed to get to. But I will tell you this. I felt better after I worked out. Even though I didn't want to go do this, I was glad that I did because I felt better after the fact. Uh, I acted myself into feeling instead of feeling myself into acting. When we love... We can do so with in declaration, but we also need to do so in decision. We just need to decide that we're going to love people even when we don't feel like it, even when we don't want to. And as we do that, the feelings will follow. One last thing under this category. Love is more than a choice we make. It's a command that we obey. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning at verse 37, we find these words. Jesus said to him, and this is in response to someone who's asking what the greatest commandment is. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus said these words. We refer to this as uh, the great commandment. We're to love God first with everything we've got and then love our neighbor as ourselves. Everything else in the Christian faith hinges back on loving God and loving people. 
it is highly important that we let the Spirit of God develop this in our lives. Now, I understand this can't be done in our own power. This has to be done in the Spirit's power. I had a friend one time I worked with who up in his office, he had a sign that said this, God loves you and I'm trying. You ever felt like that? God loves you and I'm trying really hard to do the same thing. Listening to me, my friends, I want to encourage you. Keep trying and keep letting the Spirit of God work in you to develop that love for God and for other people. Now, we've considered what love is. Now, let's consider for a moment what love does. When we love, it compels us to do the greatest things in life. When we love like Jesus did, it compels us to motivate instead of manipulate. Um, we've all probably been railroaded into doing something at some point in time in life. We've been forced. We've been manipulated, if you will. Well, that's not a loving act right there. When we love, we don't want to manipulate people. We want to motivate people. Uh, and love compels us to do that. Love compels us to discipline without demoralizing. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 5, we find these words. And, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Um, sometimes the most loving thing that we can have happen in our lives is some true loving correction. And it may not feel like lo very loving when we're receiving that, but even God corrects us because he loves us. He sometimes even has to rebuke us. And my friends, when that is the case, we need to, to receive that discipline. And God never gives that to us to the point that it demoralizes us. Now, we need to put that into practice in the relationships that we have as well, particularly with our children. Colossians 3.21 challenge us, challenges us with these words. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, children are to obey their parents in the Lord. We, we understand that. But as parents, and, and Paul addresses specifically the fathers, but it applies to mothers as well, as we train our children, we're to do so in such a way that is truly loving, but it doesn't just totally discourage or demoralize them along the way. So love compels us to discipline without demoralizing them. Love also compels us to lay down our lives instead of lift ourselves up. Uh, John 15, 13 says this, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Um, Jesus said that to the disciples, and it applies to us as well. And then he not only said it, but he modeled it. He laid down his life for us. And he expects us in the right loving relationship to as an expression of that love, we've got to sacrifice ourselves in various ways. Um, in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 25, Paul highlights how this is to be done, particularly by husbands for their wives. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. There's no way around it, my friends. If we're going to love like Jesus did, we're going to have to lay down our lives from time to time instead of lifting ourselves up. Jesus not only commanded that or instructed that, he modeled it for us as well. So this thing called love, this agape 
that God has for the world is something that can and will be developed in our lives as we are filled with the Spirit and we walk in the Spirit. Now, please hear me. I understand tonight in just the few things that I've described about uh, what this love is and what this kind of love does. I understand none of us can put this into practice simply in our own power. We've got to have the Spirit's power working in us to make this happen. And my friends, that spiritual power is available through the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the walking in that Spirit day in and day out. Now, I want to close with this uh, particular scripture in 1 John, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 7. I am convinced that we can share love only to the degree that we've experienced it. Um, now, we come into this world with the ability to love. Uh, I've been divinely reminded of that by my little grandbaby. Um, but we're to develop in that love. And, and one of the reasons that my, my little granddaughter can love so well is because she is loved so very, very much. Now, here's how John described this in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What's John saying here? This whole concept of love in theory and in practice is possible because of God. God is love and he loves you and he loves me so immensely and so deeply that he gave Jesus Christ to die for our sins. And we get little tastes of that love at various places and from various people in life. But the greatest expression of that and the greatest experience of that is when we come to know Jesus Christ for ourselves. And having been loved so deeply by him and saved so gloriously by him and then filled with his spirit, we then increase our capacity because we've been loved so deeply, we, we increase our capacity and our ability to share that love with others. So tonight as we close out, I would simply encourage you to let God love you deeply through the, the saving grace that only he can offer and through the infilling of his spirit, just Letting God have control of your life. Letting him have every bit of you. Um, and, and I understand sometimes that's an ongoing thing where, okay, you know what? I've given everything I know to give to you, Lord, at this point in my life. Hey, that's a great place to be. If God shows another area where you need to turn over to him, do so. Let his spirit and let his love fill you at that point. And my friends, you will then have a, a greater capacity to share that love with other people. Um, if we all were perfectly honest tonight, we would probably have to agree that some people are easier to love than others. Uh, you've got somebody in your life that you might have a hard time loving. I get that. I understand that. I've been there myself and may be there now for all I know. But here's what I do know. Because God loves me so deeply, sometimes in spite of me, well, maybe all the time in spite of me, actually, but because God loves me so deeply and I've experienced that love, I can now, by His power and with His help, let that kind of love grow in my life and I can share that with others. Um, I have a choice in the matter. 
But if I'm going to walk in obedience to God, then I must walk in love and share it through His power and through His grace. Uh, I pray that the love of God is overflowing in your life. And I pray that that fruit of the Spirit of love is being developed more and more. If we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We will develop the fruit of the Spirit. And the first fruit of the Spirit is love. Thank you for being a part of this study tonight. I hope you'll tune back in next week. Uh, we will be covering the next fruit of the Spirit, which is joy. God bless you. Uh, before we get to that study, we will be having church this coming Sunday. We would love for you to be a part of that service, either online or in person, if you live in this area. Thank you again for your time. God bless you, and have a good night.